This morning I'm speaking on building prophetic marriages. Building prophetic marriages. Father, we are grateful to you for this opportunity once more to share from your word. We ask, oh God, that the Holy Spirit will take over from me. Download your word, the way it is in your heart, unto us this morning. Lord, we are crying out for a healing and a restoration of our marriages. For I know that there are so many here whose marriages are hurting, whose marriages are in shambles, who are crying every day and asking God, why me? Why should I be in this kind of marriage? But Lord, thank you because today you have promised us healing and restoration in our marriages in the name of Jesus. Take over Holy Spirit and let your name be glorified. That which you desire to accomplish today, do it and take all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Building prophetic marriages as a way of introduction I just want to define again what marriage is you know about at least my own definition of it I said that marriage is a mutual coming together of two different people male and female in holy matrimony to share their lives together and like I said yesterday God in his graciousness has endowed and beautified every one of us with potentials, graces, abilities to make a difference in our world. So the essence of marriage is to enable you you know, to ooze out those potentials that the Lord has given you and use it to be a blessing, not just to your husband, not just your wife, but to be a blessing to your generation. So it's geared towards helping each other to maximize the achievement of divinely assigned life goals. Because like we also shared yesterday, everyone has a purpose. While you are planted, wherever you are planted, we are born to be a blessing. We are blessed to be blessings to our generation. So those things that God has blessed you with, when you get married, you are supposed to also use it and be a blessing to your spouse and to the kingdom. Marriage is not a master-servant relationship. It's a love affair where each complements the other. And like I always say, mar marriage is a ministry. And every couple is an assignment. That is what makes our marriages prophetic. What is a prophetic marriage? A marriage that understands that God has put them together for a specific assignment for their generation, for the kingdom. A prophetic marriage is a marriage that know that we are not just together so that every morning we wake up, we hug each other, we kiss each other and say, hey, I'm happy you are my darling. This one will say, I'm happy you are my honey. It goes beyond that. God is the one who builds prophetic marriages. He puts them together. He picks a man from wherever. And picks a woman from wherever. And brings them together. Because he has seen that with what he has put inside of them, they can affect the kingdom positively. So every marriage has a garden to tend. God first of all gave Adam and Eve a home and then he gave them a global ministry. He gave them an assignment to do for him. So the way God looks at your marriage to know whether it is a successful one is not by how many houses you have built. It's not by how many cars you have. But when you are carrying out that assignment for which he brought you and your husband together for the kingdom when that assignment is being carried out then your marriage is a prophetic successful marriage and that is
is a man, very major desire in the heart of God. He desires to build prophetic marriages. Marriages that will affect lives. Marriages that will affect the kingdom. Marriages that will make a difference in the world. Marriage is a very important thing because it reflects the core relationship between Christ and the church. That, in, is, that can be found in Ephesians chapter 5. And then we're going to read from verse 22 to 29. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll read from verse 22 to 29. I want you to look into your Bible, please. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones so that is one mystery that God used to symbolize the relationship between Christ and the church and that is why God initiated it by himself marriage is God's own initiation Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 he is the one that after he created everything that was created and saw how good they were he looked at man who he created without a companion and he said something is missing here it is not good for this man to be alone i see loneliness eating him up i don't see him being able to carry out kingdom agenda for him i have a, an, a you know a global assignment for this man but i don't see him being able to do it except i give him a helper somebody that can compliment him somebody that can make it easy for him so that together they will be able to carry out the assignment I have for them so that's how the issue of marriage came on board so the woman came into the life of the man not as an accident not as an afterthought but she appeared when she needed to appear because God saw that something was missing and needed to come in to balance the equation so every woman that is here you are here as an embodiment of solution in the life of your husband and you need to know it so that you don't go into the man's life and cause chaos turn his life upside down and become a problem instead of being a solution the lord has released right from creation an anointing for solution upon every woman everyone listening to me and you are a woman and you are married receive that anointing upon your life in the name of Jesus Amen. marriage is a journey it's not an arrival it's an art and like every other art there's so much room for improvement when it comes to marriage it's like a garden and like every beautiful garden it needs to be tend, tended you know you build it the bible says every house is built by by some man but the builder of all things is god and psalm 127 verse 1 said except the lord builds the house the labor in vain that build it marriage needs building you don't just you know, sleep and wake up and blow in tongues and a wonderful happy marriage will fall from heaven. 
It doesn't happen like that. You need to fight for your marriage. Because the marriage as you made your bed, that is how you rely on it. If your bed is full of sand, that's how you rely on it. And it will keep scratching you and making you uncomfortable. And you can't have a good sleep. But that is not the will of God for us. Concerning our marriages, the Lord wants us to have and enjoy our marriages. He wants us to have a good marriage. But we have a role to play to make the marriage enjoyable. Hallelujah. I've, I shared it in my book, Killing the Marriage Killers. And I want to share it here because I know so many people are coming to this conference for the first time. I read a story about Nikki Cruz that he found himself in an aircraft many years ago and he was seated near a satanist who was not eating anything being served in the plane. And when he asked him, are you fasting? The man said, yes. He said, then you must be a Christian. He said, no, I'm not a Christian. Who are you? He said, I'm a satanist. Satanist? Do you people fast? He said, we fast more than those of you who say you are Christians. Why do you fast? He said, number one prayer point on our list when we fast is to tear down those marriages you call Christian marriages. We want to tear them down. We don't want to see them succeed. We want to see confusion and chaos in the midst of the marriages. Our number two prayer point is to mess up and destroy the lives and the homes of those you call great men and women of God. We want to see their children you know, become vagabonds. We want to see them messed up. We want to see their ministries scattered. We don't want to see them happy. I don't think Nikki wanted to know the top prayer points because those two were already overloaded. So a lot of times we go through all kinds of problems in our homes without knowing that they are coming as siege from hell. You see your husband as a problem when he's not actually the problem. Your marriage is being stage managed from hell. One nonsense coming from somewhere is releasing a siege against that marriage. And it makes you, you know, make mountains out of more hills. Little things that should not cause problems in the marriage are magnified to become big issues. Why? Because the enemy is interested to seeing your marriage collapse. But every marriage that is represented here, today, you are hearing the sound of my voice, including those who are watching online. And your marriage is one of those marriages under the siege of the enemy. Today, we break that ugly siege in the name of Jesus. We release deliverance upon your marriage in the name of Jesus. We want to begin to look at how we can build prophetic marriages. How? How do we build it? Yesterday my topic was blessed to be a blessing. And I think that's also where to start. Be a blessing to your spouse. Add value to your spouse. If you enter into your marriage with that mindset it will make a lot of difference the woman was brought into the life of the man as a helper not as a viper because there are two different things viper bites helpers help you are in the marriage and in the life of your husband as a helper the bible says in proverbs I think it's 1822. That says he that uh, find it the wife, find it a good thing and obtain it favor from the Lord. So you are supposed to be a wife.
you are not to be a knife. But there are some wives that are knives in the house. And all they do is cut their husbands left, right, front and back. The man doesn't know anything. He doesn't do anything well. He doesn't. Everything is, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. The criticisms are more than the compliments and the appreciations. You are in that marriage to be a blessing. You are created to be a helper. Not a hell of trouble. Your husband is supposed to, after you have come into his life, know that a helper, an asset has been brought into his life, not a liability. Some women are liabilities in their homes. They add to the man's headache. They add to his responsibility. You know, he's looking for how to carry himself. Now he begins to carry you. Because you are just an excess luggage. But that is not God's portion for you. God has endowed you with so much inside of you to be a blessing in that marriage. And I activate those potentials right now in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are packaged to be a solution center. And you need to maximize those potentials to really be a solution. You know, women, we have what it takes to multiply all the good things in the life of our husband. That's why you are there to compliment him. A man, when he's sleeping with his wife, releases into the woman a tiny little seed called sperm, which sometimes you can't even see with the physical eyes. But the woman, because she has a nurturing capacity, because she has a receptacle to receive that seed, she is able to nurture it. Tiny little seed that you can't even see without the microscope. Then the woman will give back to the man a bouncing baby girl, bouncing baby boy. Sometimes two or three or four or more from just a tiny little seed. Hallelujah! That tells you the power of multiplication that the woman carries. The power of greatness in the woman. She has what it takes to make anything out of nothing. If the mother of the living, her first, her name represents, you know, the meaning of her name, if is life giver. And she's our mother. So every woman can tap from that anointing and release life not just to your husband but to everything around you. You have what it takes to release life onto it. So you should not be in that marriage and things are going, you know, like this, like this, going towards the left. Things are not working well. You are in that marriage and there's so much difficulty here and there. A lot of problems here and there. That's why you are there as the solution center tap from that oil that God has endowed you with and bring a solution into your marriage in the name of Jesus add value to your spouse I tell men this because men in particular you need to hear this some men feel threatened when their wife is doing well they feel that you know you want to just outshine me Especially those in ministry. It's not every man that preaches like his wife. There are some women that preach better than their husbands. And their husbands are intimidated because their wives seem to be shining brighter than them. You don't need to be. You don't need to be intimidated. Pour into your wife because she is your better half. She's not supposed to be your bitter half. She's your better half. When you pour into her, you are multiplying yourself. She's able to do what you cannot do. By the way, we, you know, when a woman gets married, she drops her father's name. People like us, we dropped our father's name 33 years ago. Except my family people, and very few people here, you don't even know my father's name. But everybody knows Maluba. So it's your name we carry. And if anything, it's your name that is
is becoming famous, not our father's name. So why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? There's no reason for you to be intimidated. No. So pour into your wife. I say it every time and I continue to say it. Because I mean under this kind of atmosphere, you can't lie. I tell people three quarters of whatever I am today. The Holy Ghost, you know, I mean, apart from the Holy Ghost, of course, He made me everything. So He's pouring into my life every day. But apart from Him, my husband made me whatever I am today. So when I call Him my husband of no regret, it's not just on my lips, it's from the bottom of my heart. I honor Him. I count the privilege every day to be married to Him. He doesn't invest in my life holding back. He invests like he knows he's pouring into himself. So feel free, husbands, to invest into your wives. Add value to that woman. Be a value enhancer. That's part of what we studied yesterday. Don't take away from her. So women come into the life of a man looking so pretty, looking so wonderful, glory, the glory of God is on their face. They will be in that marriage just six months, one year. The woman is looking like a shadow of herself. Why? Because of husband. The husband is beating her. If he doesn't, you know, abuse her physically, he abuses her emotionally, he abuses her with words. The things you tell your wife matters a lot. Look at you, woman. You are never do well. See other women. They are doing like this. They are doing like that. Every day, you are just on one spot. You keep telling her those negative things, it gets into her spirit. And before you know it, it begins to change her thinking, change her physique, change everything. And a woman you are married for only one year is already looking 10 years older than yourself. It's not right. All such men under this anointing, you must repent. In the name of Jesus. Because you're going out from here a different man. Be proud of your spouse. Avoid destructive criticism. You know, it makes her to withdraw. It makes him to withdraw. Be proud of each other. Pour into each other. Every avenue you see to be a blessing. Invest, 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 invest. Because investing into your wife or into your husband is like investing into yourself. Number two. Love each other deeply and express that love practically. Love your spouse deeply. Express it practically. First John chapter 3 verse 18, the Bible says, Let us not love with words or tongues, but with actions and in truth. It's more blessed to give than to receive in marital relationships. That's what the Bible says in Acts 20 verse 35. Sometimes people just like to be on the receiving end in their marriage. My husband doesn't love me. He doesn't care. He doesn't give me anything. He doesn't even look at my face. He doesn't. He doesn't. If he does not, you can begin to give to him. <laughs> Some men are from a background where nobody taught them. Nobody showed them love. So they don't even understand what it means to show love. You are telling them, you know, I'm not feeling fine. Because nobody looked at his face when he wasn't feeling fine. He doesn't understand what it means to pamper a woman. But men who don't understand such things, that is why you need to be on a, in a conference like this. Because when we come to a conference like this, we say it the way it is, practically. And we are not just talking because we want to, you know, make your ear excited. No! We expect you to go back home. 
And all these things the Lord is telling us from this altar. All of us need to put it to work. Practice. Imagine where as many marriages as are represented here are all prophetic marriages. Doing what God wants them to do. Affecting their globe. Happy with themselves. I mean the church and the society will change. We are talking about the church in prophecy. If the homes are in shambles, then the church is paralyzed. Because the home is the remote control that controls what happens in the church. That's why we felt that this particular topic is very necessary to be said here. Our homes need to be put together so that the church will be alive and strong. So seek out for ways. Seek out for opportunities. To put smile on the face of your spouse. Look out for it. Look out for it. What will I do to surprise my wife? What will I do to make my husband happy? What is that thing I've not always been doing? That if I do it, it can add a touch to my marriage. Look out for such opportunities that can help you to touch your spouse in a way that she will never forget. We read about Jesus yesterday in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. How that after he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power he did what? He went about doing good. <coughs> he went about doing good. And our brother told us yesterday that one major sign that shows that you are full of the Holy Ghost is what? Doing good. But you know this doing good. Sometimes it pains my heart that we try to do it to people outside. But we neglect those right under our nose. I remember a woman of God that the husband passed us a big church met me some time ago and she said I don't understand why the people in our church before even their prayer request gets to my husband my husband's ear they need financial this, they need financial that they want this one taken care of, that one taken care of he doesn't ever hear it without going out of his way to meet that need I'm the only one that if I have a need and I tell him I can say it up to ten times and it may not be something that will cost much money but you will always say wait now wait you are not the major issue let's take care of the people let's take care of the people and the woman is crying and dying the people are not more important than your wife your home first before ministry the Lord gave Adam a home first before he gave him a global assignment. If you are busy, I don't need all those thousands of people in your congregation and you neglect your wife. Very soon you will discover that they have found another father and they will leave you and disappear. And now you are left with your wife alone. Meanwhile, they too are, are watching to see how well you are taking care of your wife. In one church, we had the, the altar, you know, the, the pastor sit on the altar and face the congregation. So the pastor's wife also sits on the altar. And then she will just be on the altar as the husband is preaching. She's busy just making face, you know. She will turn this way. After a while, she will turn this way. And then she will just be making faces that will help you to know that this woman does not believe that what the husband is saying is true. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, my friend, stop deceiving the people. Come down here. Yeah? We know ourselves inside. What is that? All those gymnastics and cover up is not necessary. You know? The husband is weird. She's just like... <laughs> you know? And the congregation will be watching. They may not say any other thing to the congregation. But that is already a major statement. It's a major statement. So, husband and wife, please look out for ways to pour into each other. To show practical love. 
I love you, I love you, I love you. Show it, show it, show it. You remember that story? That story about two love birds. One was there on the road. The other one was in the bush. And one was calling out to the other. Hi bird, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. The other one in the bush was saying, show it, show it, show it. It's not about, I love you, I love you, I love you. Do what? Show it, show it, show it. There are some husbands here who have married their wives for 20 years, 25 years and more. And the wife cannot boast of one thing she can say. This is what my husband bought for me. Those kind of husbands, if they are here, they need to answer altar call. <laughs> they need to repent again and again and be born again afresh. Because that is iniquity, abomination in high places. I love you, I love you, I love you. You only love her in bed. I love you, I love you, I love you. When you want her to make babies for you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Nothing to show for it. You love with empty mouths. All the husbands who are here, who love with empty mouth, today, repent in the name of Jesus. And begin to love in practical terms. <laughs> Number three, we're talking about how to build prophetic marriages. Appreciate the efforts of each other. And admire each other deeply. Appreciate the effort of your spouse. Many of our spouses are really trying. They make effort. They go out of their way to make you happy, to take care of you. And sometimes some of us are so ungrateful. Some women are so ungrateful. There's nothing called compliment or appreciation on their lips. Everything that comes out from their lips is what? Criticism. Criticism. You never do. You never do. You always do. You always... Everything is negative. No goodly word. No word that can encourage their spouse comes from their mouth. Appreciate the effort of each other. In Igbo, we say, When you thank them, them, the woman that makes the native bees, because it takes so much effort and time to make. We appreciate her for the work she has made. She's encouraged to make more. Learn appreciation. Some of us women, our mouth too bad. Hey! Our mouth needs circumcision. Hey! We need deliverance in our mouth. Because so many marriages that are here, what has kept them in the place where they are is uh, our mouth, the words we have spoken. That's where the strange woman is better than many of us. The Bible says concerning her in Proverbs 5 verse 3, the mouth of the strange woman drips like honey from the honeycomb. Her words are smoother, smoother than butter. Are you surprised that some strange women are beginning to snatch great men of God? One doctor that is deep into committing abortion. Somewhere in Benin. Somebody was preaching to him and confronting him. He said, the way you just, you know, abort for these young girls. You are killing her. You are just murdering lives. You have to give account of it. He said, well, but the girls, many of the girls that are my patient, whom I'm taking care of, now in the pastors, they pregnant them. So when they want to cover the shame, they bring them to me. So if God is going to judge me, he will judge with the pastors first. Which is true, because judgment will start from the house. to ask the Lord to circumcise our mouth so we can say only what is right.
Proverbs 18, 22, 21. It says, life and death lie in the power of the tongue. You eat the fruit that comes from it. Whatever you say, that's what you harvest. Proverbs 12, 18, it says, the reed that speaks like the piercing of a sword. Some of us here, when you talk to your husband, it's like they use a, a sword and pierce through his heart. There is that speaketh like the piercing of the sword. But the tongue of the wise promotes healing. Let your tongue release healing unto your spouse. In the name of Jesus. Don't compare your spouse with anybody else. Doesn't matter how good that person is. Whether you're a man or you're a woman. Don't compare your spouse with anyone else. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't help healthy relationship. And then learn. Learn to compliment good things when you see it. Some of us think it is carnality. You know? It's carnality to be romantic. It's carnality to compliment your husband. A man, handsome man that God has dashed you. Huh? He goes and then he, he, he comes back with a beautiful haircut. You don't even notice it that he had a beautiful haircut. You just pretend as if you didn't even see it. Because you think you are being very spiritual. If I tell him now, Daddy, he, you are handsome, then his head will swell. If the head swells, what happens? <laughs> Does he have not have a right to feel good that his wife is complimenting him? Some of us, the kind of husbands the Lord gave us, eh? He just packaged them and dashed us. Dash. Eh? Including me. The Lord just packaged the best, the most handsome husband in this world and dashed me. I don't take it for granted at all. I don't take it for granted at all. I see him as a major project that God has given to me. So, I think about it. How can I make this man happy? How can I pour into his life? How can I add value to his life? For me, taking care of him is a major project. I tell my daughters around me, ACD Dioka. Eh? Better husband is castle. Anybody where you have and dash anyone, Papa and take good care of them. It's not only a ZY that is okay. Eh? It's not only the virtuous woman that her prize is far above rubies. ACG the okay. So if God gives you one, take good care of him. Pamper him. Take good care of him in every way. Admire him. Appreciate him. By the way, those compliments and admiration you are holding from your husband, there will not be opportunity to give it to him in heaven. No? In case you don't know that there will be no marriage in heaven. So everything you need to do to pour into the life of the man, this is the best time to do it. Even though secretly, me and my sweetie, we have been asking the Lord secretly, in case you change your mind and there will not be marriage in heaven, we apply to remain together for life, for eternity. Hallelujah! Meanwhile, some people are praying every day and say, you know, Olembe, Kanya Muga, Onye Nsoputa, Olembe, they want Jesus to come sharp sharp not because they are feeling the assignment in life but because they are tired of one man that is a bone in a thorn in their flesh oh Lord when, I, when will I be delivered from this trouble if you don't want to deliver me from this man take my life now let me come home and rest Every such person, whether man or woman, that that has been your heart cry. Today, the 
Lord will turn your marriage around. In the name of Jesus. When you go home, take your time and read. So many scriptures in Song of Solomon. I won't have time for that. But they all teach you the need to express love. Because love that is not expressed is love that is denied. Song of Solomon chapter 7 verse 1 to 9. You read it when you go home. But then another one is Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse 9 to 12. But let me see if I can read just one. Because sometimes when you read some of these scriptures you feel like you know, or when you ask women to compliment their husbands, they look at you as you are being carnal. And they have no idea that God himself delights in close romantic relationship with us. And that's what he tried to portray through the Song of Solomon. Chapter 7 verse 1, he says, How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O princess daughter. The calves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Badrabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon. Which looks down upon Damascus. This is in your Bible, no? I'm not reading from my head. <laughs> so when you go home, you read the rest of it. We don't have time. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying that to say one of the major things that keeps marriage alive is compliments. Compliments. If you hold it from your spouse, people outside will help to give it to him. And then he might be tempted to look at that strange woman. Because their, their eyes are not closed. Their ears are not closed. They meet people. If he's wearing that beautiful suit, you didn't even notice that suit. And then he goes out. And then he's secretary in the office who is not a Christian. But who has good mouth and who knows what compliments can do. Begins to dust him. Wow. Oh God, you're looking sharp. Hey. Oh God, this suit is Italian. <laughs> Oh God, the fitting on this suit is too much. And then everything inside your husband is just standing up and dancing like this. And then meanwhile, you are busy holding compliments from him. You are your own. Oh. It's not when it happens. You say, Mommy, mother, but pray for my husband. I don't know what he's doing with the secretary. Where were you when he started with the secretary? You left your duty post for the secretary. The secretary is only helping you to carry out your assignments. <laughs> Women who are not on their duty post in their home, in the area of taking care of their husband, complimenting them, encouraging them, boosting their morale, receive wisdom from this altar. So you can go home and know that your husband is your, your major project in life. He's your number one project. You need to take good care of him. Part of doing that is learning to celebrate important days in your life. Some of you can just stay like that and you know, your husband maybe birthday or Father's Day, Mother's Day anniversaries, important days just come and they pass like that. Uncelebrated, uncommemorated. That is wrong. That is very wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Celebrating good things. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says, shouts of victory. Resounds in the tent of the righteous of the Lord. The Lord's right hand doeth mighty things for them. Most of the time in glory house, we are always celebrating. Because it's either this person's bad day, or the other one's bad day, or the other person's bad day. There is always shouts of joy and rejoicing in my house. Because God continuously does great things for us. You may not throw a big party, but just mark that day. Darling, happy birthday. It's not wrong. 
Because some of you think when you tell somebody happy birthday, then you are backsliding. You are no more spiritual. And you don't want to even remember the birthday so that she will not be expecting you to buy something. Then you pretend you did not remember it's her birthday. Later on, when she will say, Ah, I mean, you did not even tell me, I'll be like, Oh, I forgot. You did not forget anything. You didn't forget. You are just running away from responsibility. What does it cost to buy your wife a beautiful, just a bottle of perfume? Yeah. Darling, this is for your birthday. And then we wives, when they buy, no matter how little the gift is, the important thing is the thoughtfulness in their hearts that they are able to remember and they are able to buy something. So it's not when they give it to you, you say, of everything in this world you sought to buy. Now one bottle of, bring a bottle of perfume. It's not all you saw. Is it not men that give their wives luxuries as birthday presents? If you cannot appreciate that little bottle of perfume, don't expect luxuries. Because your appreciation will bring out the rest. Hallelujah. Be best of friends. Be best of friends with your spouse. This is very, very important. Because that is the essence of marriage. Originally when God made a man and a woman, Genesis 2, 18, it was because he saw that the man was lonely. And he said it's not good for this man to be alone. So marriage is majorly for companionship. Marriage is 90% friendship. It's just 10% of, uh, you know, taking care of your rules, obeying rules and regulations. But the major thing is what? Friendship. Be friends. Whatever you think your husband can solicit from a concubine. Give him that and more. The reason why we are having strange women issues arising in our homes is because we are not doing our homework. We are not there for our husbands. We are not, we don't enjoy their company. There are women that when their husbands travel is usually their best time. The man, especially these men that travel, either they go for ministry or they go to the rig or something. When the man comes and tells you, look, oh, I'm going to read. They are sending me there for one month. In front of him, you pretend that you are going to miss him. Eh? One whole month? You'll be away from this one one month. Oh, Lord, how are we going to survive? Everywhere is just going to look dry and empty. Then the same woman will now run into her bedroom and say, Father, <laughs> it's not a worse prayer. <laughs> this man will be away for one month. So somebody can at least drink water and keep cup. <laughs> hey, Holy Spirit, thank you very much. <laughs> I give you all the glory. <laughs> you are here. All you wives who do those kind of things, you are here. <laughs> but the Lord is releasing deliverance today in the name of Jesus. Enjoy spending quality time with your husband or with your wife. And let it not be time that, you know, you will just be releasing criticism. Let it be a time of, you know, boosting his morale, encouraging him. Be a positive possibility thinker. Be optimistic in everything. You know, by so doing, you become his biggest moral booster. People like my husband are big dreamers. Every time, once and one, you know, from time to time, he comes out with big dreams. Dreams that you as an individual will look at in the eyes of the flesh and you will say, how? How in the world would this be possible? But from the day when I married him, the Holy Ghost says, I'll be giving him big dreams. When he shares it with you, stand by him and encourage him. So when he comes, including even the dream of buying this property, all I said is, honey, if the Lord says he has given you this place, I'm standing with you. We are possessing it. And that's how we have come here. Now it's no longer a dream. It's what? A reality. Hallelujah. But he could also have married a wife who would have said, Ah, now what for you, Yusuf? Who does monkey banana? <laughs> eh? How can you be dreaming of, you didn't even talk of one plus, two plus, 500 and something plus of land? Where are we getting the money? How will you do this? Maybe that dream would have died here. Maybe you wouldn't have been here today. So wives, don't kill your husband's dreams. Don't be a dream killer. Don't be a destiny killer. You are there to add to him. To add value. Not to take away. You are there as a plus, not a minus. 
So when he brings those big dreams, please support him. Hallelujah. Build your home. Build it and enjoy it. That's how to build a prophetic marriage. Every home needs building. Build it. Proverbs 14 1. It says, A wise woman builds her home, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. There are two major pillars needed in building every home your words and your actions. The words you speak over your spouse, they are very, very powerful. The words you speak over your home and ministry, that is what you will see happen. So, you are a major pillar in your home, woman. The man is the foundation of every home. Because any house without a foundation, it will collapse. So, he is a foundation of the home. So, he is a strong man. Then the home is built on a solid foundation. But the woman is the pillar that is holding the home in place. The Bible says in Psalm 144 verse 12, your daughter shall be like pillars fashioned after the similitude of a palace. We are like pillars, cornerstones. So whatever you do and say your home to a great extent affects what happens in your home. You are the climate controller. Woman of God. You are not just a thermometer in your home. You are a thermostat. A thermostat regulates the temperature. When the temperature is getting too high, you turn it down. When it's getting too low, you take it up. You control the climate, the atmosphere that operates in your home. So, Set that correct atmosphere that will make homecoming a pleasure for your husband. Quit nagging. Many of us are great naggers. You nag the man from us. You are welcoming him. You are already nagging. You didn't give any money here before you went out. So now, I think, immediately you settle down now you want food. So, am I supposed to have brought the food from heaven and give it to you? Eh? You useless man. You don't know your responsibility in the home. And then you talk and talk and talk and talk. This is a man who has been at work. Who is just coming back. Maybe in work, everybody's answering him, sir, sir, sir. They honor him, they respect him. Then when he comes to his home, his wife would dress him and say, look at you, toothless bulldog. Eh? Look at you, mother's bottle, short engine. And then you tell him everything that is in your mouth. And the man will just start looking for himself. It's like, whatever he was in the office, is brought down to the ground when he comes back to his house. All such women, they don't have strength though, because some of them are the people that push the man to domestic violence. We talk and talk and talk and talk, and the man is so angry and he gives it to you. Whoa! And then he says, you give me today, you give me today, yeah, yeah, everybody come and see, you give me today. But no take up strength. Hey? If they ask you to fight back, no thank about strength. But the strength is where? <laughs> in the mouth. <laughs> in the mouth. When you open it, it will run like that. By the time you feel it dressing the man down, the man is looking at himself. He's like, am I still a man? <laughs> where am I? Where is my prestige? Where is my honor? All such women. Your deliverance is here today. In the name of Jesus. I mentioned about building your home and enjoying it. Have fun in your relationship with your spouse. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 9, live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your life, which God has given you under the sun. For that is your portion in life and the labor which you perform under the sun. Live joyfully. Make an effort to maintain peace in your home. You get nothing by making your home, you know, a chaotic place. A place where your husband comes to and then he doesn't have peace. You gain nothing by doing that. Make your home a peaceful place. And learn to be happy yourself because unhappy people have a way of making others unhappy. They don't even see any reason why you should be happy. See, they're not happy. But don't let anybody steal your joy. Why? Because you are the architect of your joy. 
you are responsible for your joy. Even if you are married to the worst man on earth, you can still be happy in the marriage if you choose to. So don't let your husband be the one that will determine whether you are happy. Each time he's not there, you're happy. When he comes, he knows what to do. And he will just puncture all the tongues and all the whole, the Holy Ghost inside of you. He will just puncture it. And you come back to square one. It's not your portion in the name of Jesus. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, A merry heart does good like medicine. Be happy. Be happy. You know, be happy with life. So many women are dying of high BP today. Even pastor's wives. Because our pastor's wife, their own case is worse. Because, you know, everybody looks at you there. And then they come to you with their own problems. You, you don't know who to run to. Because it's not every pastor's wife that has a mentor. Some think that they have all that it takes. to stand there up. So when it fills your head and your mind, you don't know what to do. You begin to think and think and think and think. That is BP. By the time the BP becomes too much, the person slumps. And they say, the woman of God just gave up. She just slumped and she died. It may not be slumping and dying. That was just an overnight slumping and dying. It may be, you know, a piling of so many things. Issues in the heart. And she did not know who to talk to. But bodies are lifted at Gilgal altar. You will pour those bodies on God's altar today. You will carry it back home. In the name of Jesus. But guard your joy. Guard it jealously. Because if you allow yourself to be controlled, pushed back and forth, your joy manipulated. And then you just quench and die. If your husband loves you too much, he might decide to give you six months and mourn you. Before even the six months expires, one other CC that is young enough to be your daughter eh? is already shaking bum bum <laughs> around uh, your husband. Uh, me and daddy, we are getting married. <laughs> me and daddy, we are planning our wedding. And then somebody will just come from the back here and come and eat where she did not sow. It will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, you will plant a vineyard. Isaiah 65, verse 21 to 22. You will build houses and you will inhabit them. You will plant vineyards and you will eat the fruit of them. You will not build and another inhabit. You will not plant and another eat. In the name of Jesus. You will live to enjoy the work of your hands. That is the word of God. And so shall it be for you. In the name of Jesus. I mentioned a few more points and we begin to pray. Choose your association. You want to build a prophetic marriage? You must hang out with people who also have the same desire with you. You don't go and, you know, make friends with people. Who, when they gather, they will say, hmm, You see that, that man? By the time I finish dealing with him, he will regret that he married me. And you're like, Eh, which man? My, I, I'm talking about my husband. That foolish man. Why you keep hanging around such people? Before you know, you start talking like them, start thinking like them. Before you know, you start copying their ways. Whereas when your husband is angry and he's talking and you keep quiet and you're just saying, Darling, I'm sorry. Now they will teach you. Who is it to talk to you like that? When he's angry and he's talking to you, you shout back. He has mouth, you have mouth. He has face, you have face. What is it? And then you learn it and begin to practice it in your home. Before you know it, your home is turned into shreds. Choose your association. Because the company you keep, that's what shapes your habit. It shapes your behavior. It shapes your speech. It shapes everything about you. First Corinthians 15.33 It says, evil communication corrupts good manners. Second Kings 3 verse 14 to 16 Elisha told Jehoshaphat that if not that he had regard for him, 
He would not have spoken to him because Jehoram, the king of Israel, hanging out with him, closed the heavens over Jehoshaphat. There are friends you hang out with and they close the heavens over your life. Daddy will always say, not every friend is made for every page of the book of your life. There are friends made for page one of chapter one of the book of your life. When you are done with that, leave them and move on to chapter two. Because when you struggle to carry them along, they become excess luggage for you. May the Lord give you wisdom, even in this conference, to discern relationships that you must quit from and new relationships that you must get into. In the name of Jesus, take good care of yourselves. Remain attractive to each other. That is very important. Every man wants his wife to remain attractive and beautiful. And, you know, lovely for him. Especially in the way she dresses. You know? Don't go dressing like uh, uh, you are in the, in the 19th century. In this 21st century. Because you think that is part of being spiritual. You don't take care of yourself. Your hair is, you know, unkept. Some of us, you know, do some things we do on it. We don't wash it for months. So even when you are with your husband in bed, and it feels like coming close to touch his bride, the, 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 the beautiful fragrance, beautiful in quotes, that will ooze out from the hair. He will say, oh, don't worry, don't worry. My leg, my hand just touched you. I didn't mean to. Because you have turned already thinking that he's uh, looking for something. But then he will tell you, don't worry, don't worry. Because that, that order is not necessary. He does not need it. We need to take good care of ourselves. Using perfume and using deodorant is not a sin. It was perfume, expensive one for that matter, that was broken and used to anoint Jesus. The alabaster box. Smell good. Dress well. That you have been married for two years or three years. And you have one or two children. It's not a permission. To eat and eat and eat and blood and blood and blood. That anybody who sees you will call you mommy Yabo. <laughs> the way you are traveling with your husband. You are going for a meeting. The man is still looking sharp. And beautiful and handsome. He dressed in his suit. Then you will wear your own boo boo. And then you'll be boo booing around him, boo booing like this. <laughs> when they see him and greet him, good evening, sir. The next question is, oh, it's like your mom came from the village. <laughs> the mom from the village is you. That he gave you 10 years gap. But because you are not taking good care of yourself, you are not looking like mother from the village. Eh? It is not your portion in the name of Jesus. Husbands, take good care of your wives. Some of us have been married for 33 years. 33 years. But we're still trying to take good care of ourselves and look chaseable. Because our husbands are taking good care of us. That is the gospel truth. Your wife can only look how you want her to look. It's not when you see other women in church who like made their look. I wish that your wife was looking like that. And yet, you cannot make her to look like that. Provide what she needs to look like that. And she will look like that for you. Then, it's very, very important. If there's any challenge in the marriage. That you quickly release forgiveness to each other. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Learn to talk, learn to talk. Talking, talking out your problems is one major matter. In fact, one book I read, he said, communication is the life wire of every marriage. The same way blood is so important to the body, that is how communication is important to every marriage. Learn to communicate. 
Of course, we are talking about prophetic marriage. You can't have a prophetic marriage. We are the husband and wife don't pray together. We are the don't study the word of God. We are the not connected with the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one that puts in them what it takes to affect the kingdom. What it takes to fulfill the assignment that God has given to them. So if you want to have a prophetic marriage, you cannot afford to keep the Holy Ghost outside your home. Bring him in. Bring him on board as much as you can. Submit yourselves one to another. We're always talking about, talk about wives. Submit your, to your husband, which is good. But the Bible in Ephesians 5.21 also says, submitting one to another. What does that mean? At least it's important to do consultations. Don't run your home like you're just a one-man squad. Your wife is there not as a slave. She is there as a helper. She needs to know what you need help for before she comes in with her helping anointing. So carry her along in your decisions. Carry your wife along. There are so many GOs here that church members get to hear everything that is happening in church before even your wife hears it in the bedroom. So she's looked at like, an, like, you know, like a second class person in the church. And yet she's supposed to be your better half. Before even you bring it out to the church, you're supposed to have discussed it in your bedroom and prayed into it. That is very, very important. Then try as much as you can to make out time for each other. Make out time for your wife. Don't just allow her, you know, to be the one always managing. Every time you will give time to other people, you know, spend time here and there. Whenever you come back, she wants to talk to you. She wants to discuss something with you. I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm tired. I'm tired. I don't have time. I don't have time. There is no way you don't have time and you don't have time. And your marriage will be able to work if there is no time. You have to make out time for your marriage. Make your marriage as romantic as possible. This is important. We've already talked about the need to complement each other. In addition to that, let your marriage be what? Romantic. Romance can be expressed in words. It can be expressed in actions. It can be expressed even through the love notes. You can exchange with each other. GSM has made it so easy to have a romantic marriage if you want to. In our days, we didn't have GSM. So if your husband travels or is not near you, there's no way to communicate. Except you want to write a love letter, which might take a long time to deliver, then the answer will come. But now you can even be here. Your spouse is not here in this conference. And you can send a text and say, something is happening here. This is what they are teaching us here. And in one minute, your spouse will reply. From time to time, it's not out of place. Those words, I love you. You mean so much to me. Thank you. Little words that can easily be spoken. But they have great weight. Both in the realm of the spirit and, the realm, and in the realm of the emotions. I love you. I love you. We women are never tired of hearing our husband say, I love you. We're never tired. And it doesn't mean that men don't want to hear, I love you. You can also tell your husband, I love you. And as you're saying, I love you, I love you, do what? Show it. Don't stop with, I love you, I love you. Show it. So make your marriage romantic in every way. You can do it. Let there be love and excitement in the way you relate with your husband. Then it's so important that you keep yourself pure. Fly away from immorality. The Lord told me while I was preparing for this message. There are some ministers who are here. There are also some husbands who are here. Who are living in immorality. Some their wives know. Some their wives are not aware. But I want to let you know, part of the reason why you are on this altar is to receive your deliverance. And today, receive your deliverance in the name of Jesus. You have no business living in immorality. Proverbs 5 verse 15 to 19 says, Drink water from your own system. 
running water for your own well? Should your fountain be dispersed abroad? Streams of water in the streets? Are you a distributor? Yesterday, God was talking to us about distributing blessings, but it's not distributing fountain. That one is different. Keep it to yourself. Keep it to your wife. Don't distribute here and distribute there and distribute there. Because so many men have endangered their life by doing so. Proverbs 7 from 21 to 23 and then 26 to 27 he says, with her enticing speech she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips she seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare he did not know it will cost him his life for she has cast down many wounded and all who were slain by her we are strong men her house is the way to hell descending to the chambers of death hey Proverbs 6 23. The lamp for the commandment is a lamp. The law is a light. Reproof of instruction are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a loaf of bread. Hey! Why do you need to reduce yourself to that level? By the means of a harlot, a seductress, a man is reduced to a loaf of bread. Hey! What is she carrying that your wife does not have? Why? Will you not keep to your own fountain? The Lord spoke before this conference and he said, I'm bringing to this meeting many that have been wounded in battle. Bishops, general overseers, pastors. But they have been wounded in battle. Many have compromised in so many ways. But he said, I will heal them on this altar. Amen. So if you are in that group, receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Finally, I will just say this and then I will mention little things there's something I saw in WhatsApp which I really think I need to drop with you. I mentioned that and begin to pray. I know I have just very little time left. But it's so important that you make your sex life fun. Marriage without sex is not complete. Sex without marriage is not complete. You have no right to even get into sex without marriage. Young people, save it for the right time. Premarital sex is a sin. It's an abomination before God. But when you are married, make it fun. Put life into your sex life. God is interested in that area. Just like he is in every other area of your life. See your marriage as part of the spiritual warfare you need to carry out. Don't see it as, you know, let me just do it anyhow. It's not something you do anyhow. It's a major project God has put in your hand for which you have to give account. Genesis 3, uh, 38 from verse, I think it's 10, or it's verse, verse 10. The story of Onan who slept with his brother's wife as was the custom in those days. He was supposed to release a seed into the brother's wife because the brother died without the seed. And then he thoroughly enjoyed himself with his brother's wife when it was time to do the meat for. He came out and spilled it on the ground. And the Bible says, God saw it. He was angry and he smote him right on the spot. So God sees the way you relate with your spouse in your bedroom. God sees it. Those of you who think having a relationship with your wife is what you do only when Nepal takes light. Nepal can take light, but God's light does not go away. He sees what you are doing. So do it well. 
Some of you are here. You rape your wives. Each time you want to sleep with them, you rape them. One of my sons here told me about a neighbor that was living with them. That, you know, they were going to a Pentecostal church. But every night, this woman will be crying through the night. Later on, the Spirit of God told her that the husband rapes her. Told my son that the husband of this woman rapes her. It didn't make sense to him. How can a husband rape his wife? And when he had the courage to go and confront them, yours truly, the bro in his holiness was really raping his wife. So this woman will be crying in pains because he didn't believe in you know toasting a woman. He didn't believe in what a woman calls for play. He believes that that one is carnality. How can I come and be touching my wife and sucking her breast? How can I come and you know be telling her things? So he comes like a rider on top of a horse. <laughs> Madam, lie where? <laughs> and then he just he walk, he walk, 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 walk. He's already living. And the woman is crying. Because God who designed that part of the woman's body designed it in a way that some things need to take place to take, get that part ready for the man. When you don't do what you're supposed to do, you are raping your wife. So those of you, you are, you are toasting your wife for before you married her. You knew all those beautiful things to say. Now you have married her, you have forgotten all those toasting words. So when you want to sleep with her, you say, Oh girl, come. Madame, lie well. And then Madame will also, of course, lie well for you. I said, I beg you, come out, bro. Because you are the only one enjoying it. She's not even enjoying anything. Huh? Sometimes such women, that's why each time you touch them, they'll tell you my head, my shoulder, my knee, my toe. Everywhere he is paining me. I'm not interested. Don't touch me. Because there is a way to do it. Those who have read our book and those who have been under my teaching on marriage, they know that we call it what? Fellowship. So that it can sound very spiritual for those of you who want to sound very spiritual. It's the fellowship of the bedroom that is only available to husband and wife. And incidentally, it has the same order of service like the fellowship in the church. So when it is time for the fellowship of the bedroom, you don't just run into the matter. You spend time to do some opening prayer. <laughs> After you have done that, then there should be some time for praise and worship. Then you can even share some testimonies. You know how much you mean to me, what you mean to me, the sugar in my tea. You are the best thing God has done for me. One woman said, My husband is my spinal cord. <laughs> Without him, I'm not standing. I said, Okay, I said, okay well, that's another dimension. <laughs> you know, there are sweet things you can tell each other if you really want to toast your wife or your husband. If you really want to admire and appreciate, there are things to admire and appreciate. All of that is just preparing the way for the man of God to come and speak the word. When you don't clear the field very well, the man of God cannot have visa. Even if he forces his way through, he won't be able to get to the promised land. Because it's so important that he gets to the holy land. And how do you do that? By making sure you do all the preambles. Or you know man calls it for play. Play, play where they happen before the men matter. Then when the woman's body is set for you, then the man of God can appear. Don't be appearing before your time, man of God. You are too precious to just appear like that. Say, madam, okay. Madam, lie where? You are too precious to appear like that. 
wait for the right time because when you appear at the right time then you can preach the gospel with power and anointing so that you can have the right impact and together you carry your bride to the promised land when you finish don't forget to share the grace in fellowship and then everybody can sleep <laughs> hallelujah all right let me round up with this before we pray i got this paper from what's up but i really think it's something you need to hear and take it home with you i'm glad it's going to be part of the tape seven things you should give your spouse daily i don't know the author the author didn't put his name but i read it and it made sense to me and since then i've been you know i mean it has helped me too to improve in my own relationship with my husband seven things you should give your spouse daily when it comes to giving many married people are generous to everybody except their spouses did you hear that and that is an error a big error for that matter there are seven things you should give your spouse daily these are not weekly monthly or annual giving they are things you must give your spouse when daily number one give your spouse a touch one of the ways to bond with your spouse is to give him a touch give her give her a touch we have encouragement touch affirmation touch healing touch apology touch and we have sexual touch study your partner and know what kind of touch to give at a particular time if you want god to touch your marriage then do what touch your spouse touch your spouse don't let today go without touching your partner that's number one number two give your spouse a space as much as you need to bond with your spouse and be together for daily intimacy communication affection planning yet you still need to give your spouse his or her space there is time for couples prayer and there is time for couples bonding there is also time for personal prayer personal meditation personal rest personal planning don't choke your spouse don't be over possessive and over demanding to your spouse stop unnecessary policing and monitoring stop unnecessary policing and monitoring give your spouse a space they need when they need it number three give your spouse a call or chat at least daily some people can chat with all their contacts on their phone and all their friends on their friends list or facebook but they never chat or call their spouse throughout the day chatting or calling your spouse in a day at work is a way of saying my dear despite my busy schedule i have you in my mind i'm thinking about you make sure you send a chat give a call to your spouse today make it a daily thing nobody can be tired of receiving a caring chat or call from someone they love number four give your spouse a hug hugging is fast disappearing in many marriages today it has been researched that hugging is one of the emotional needs of every human being it is scarcity of spousal hug that makes many men to hug ladies who are not their wives indiscriminately when you don't hug your husband he will not be looking for other people to hug <laughs> many women too crave for hugs and they allow every Tom and Jerry to hug them because their husbands are not giving them hugs. It might be in the morning, it might be at night. Let no day pass without your hugging your spouse. It's one valuable thing you must give your spouse. It could be a welcoming hug, a goodbye hug, an appreciation hug, affirmative hug. Hugging is a non-verbal means of communication. Use it well. Don't let your husband or wife crave for hug from strangers when you are still alive hug passionately hug romantically number five give your spouse a smile go smiles on a home when couples smile at each other a smile is a way of telling your spouse you delight me your presence amuses me i'm pleased to be with you frowning at your spouse is not a thing 
that should last the whole day. One of the ways to know when your marriage is smelling is when you are not smiling with each other. Did you hear that? That's one way to know if your marriage is smelling. Smile is one of the best gifts you can give your spouse in a day. I love to smile a lot. And I love to see my husband smile. I don't like people who are not generous with their smile. It is free. You don't need to pay to smile. Just relax your muscles and smile. Couples, smile. Keep smiling. To prevent your marriage from smelling, keep smiling with your spouse. Number six, give your spouse peace of mind. The home is the end point of everything we do daily. If you are a doctor, you can't sleep in the hospital all the days of your life. You will need to come home. If you are an engineer, you can't sleep in the site all days. If you are a lawyer, you can't sleep in the bar all days. Even as a pastor, you can't be in church 24-7. You must go home. So home is the end point. So if your spouse will be excited to come home, it must be a peaceful home. Stop nagging. Stop fighting. Stop insulting. Abusing. Threatening. Humiliating your spouse. Give him rest of mind. Give your wife, give your husband rest of mind. Be the head of your wife, sir. Not the head deck of your wife. There's a difference between being the head and being the head deck. Men, you are our head. You should not be the head deck. <laughs> Madam, be a wife, not a knife to your husband. Bless our couples that give each other peace of mind daily. Give your spouse a prayer. Number seven. No matter how wealthy or highly connected you are, there are things you cannot do for your spouse. You are limited. One of the ways to show love to your spouse is to commit him or her to the unlimited God. Say a word of prayer concerning your spouse daily. Every other thing may fail and may not work, but no force can withhold the power of prayer. You can't heal your spouse. Only God can heal him. You can lengthen the days of your you can't lengthen the days of your spouse. Only God can do that. You can't save your spouse. Only God can do that and take away addiction and evil habits. Only God can do that. But mention his name day and night before God. As a man, you are the priest of your family. Lay hands on your wife. Lay hands on your children. Prophesy over them as much as you can on a daily basis. It's a major gift many couples find difficult to give each other. But blessed is that wife whose husband gives a gift of prayer daily. Pray for your spouse if you don't want him or her to become a prey in the hand of the devil. So, all these seven things you must give your spouse daily are very easy, simple, free, and important. Put them on your to-do list. Don't forget to give it. Remember, give us never lack. If you give your spouse all this, I can assure you there is a high assurance that you will get it back from your spouse. Hallelujah! Yeah. Then finally, I'll mention just a few things from this particular one. Choose to love each other even in the, is the best advice, the best marriage advice ever. Choose to love each other even in, this, in those moments when you struggle to like each other. Love is a commitment, it's not a feeling. Always answer the phone when your husband or wife is calling. And when possible, try to keep the phone off when you are together with each other. Make time together a priority. Budget for a consistent date from time to time. Time is the currency of good relationships. So consistently invest time into your marriage. Surround yourself with friends who will strengthen your marriage. And remove yourself from friends who may tempt you to compromise your character. Make laughter the soundtrack of your marriage. Share moments of joy. And even in hard times, find reasons to laugh. In every argument, remember that there won't be a winner and a loser. You are partners in everything. So you will either win together or lose together. So work together to find a solution. Remember that a strong marriage rarely has two strong people at the same time. It is usually a husband and wife taking turns, being, being strong for each other in the moments when the other feels weak. 
prioritize what happens in the bedroom. It takes more than sex to build a strong marriage. But it's nearly impossible to build a strong marriage without sex. Give your best to each other, not your leftovers, after you have given your best to everyone else. Learn from each other, but don't feel the need to compare your life or your marriage to anyone else's marriage. God's plan for your life is masterfully unique. Don't put your marriage on hold while you're raising your kids or else you will end up with an empty nest and an empty marriage. Never keep secrets from each other. Secrecy is the enemy of intimacy. Never lie to each other. Lies break trust and trust is the foundation of a strong marriage. When you make a mistake, admit it quickly and humbly seek forgiveness. Be quick to say, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. When your husband or wife breaks your trust, give him or her forgiveness, which will promote healing and create opportunity for trust to be rebuilt. Be quick to say, I forgive you. Let's move forward. Be patient with each other. Your spouse is always more important than your schedule. Pastors, hear this. Your spouse is always more important than your schedule. Mother, the kind of marriage that will make your sons want to grow up to be good husbands. And your daughters want to grow up to be good wives. Never talk badly about your spouse to other people. Or vent about them online. Protect your spouse at all times and in all places. Always wear your wedding ring. It will remind you that you are always connected to your spouse. And it will remind you the rest of the world that you are off limits. Connect into a community of faith. A good church can make a world of difference in your marriage and family. Pray together. Every marriage is stronger with God in the middle. Finally, when you have to choose between saying nothing and saying something mean to your spouse, say nothing every time. Try to reconsider divorce. You know, that is, don't even think about it. Because perfect marriage is just two imperfect people who have refused to give up on each other. Hallelujah! Rise up on your feet. We want to pray.